Richard is represents the future. He is part. He is the he is the emblem of the new generation of young AIDS scholars who did not live through the epicenter of the crisis, and who is reapproaching our history through documentation, through archives, through oral history, with great rigor. And in this way, some of our most dearly held beliefs that we acquire through our experiences are proving to be false, fake news, and needing to be reassessed. So I think that we're really lucky to have people who are bringing us through a re-examination of uh, tropes and also of structures of thought that I don't think any of us would have questioned on our own. So I hope that, that if, if the rest of the field can reach the level of accomplishment of this book, then I think our job is done. So I'm very excited to present Rich. He's going to uh, present some of this material. And then afterwards, we're going to open it up for Q&A. So welcome. Thank you. Okay, that works. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming today, and thank you, Sarah, for facilitating the get together here, and to Greg, and to Donnie, and to the volunteers for hosting. So, thank you. I'm going to jump straight into a reading, a passage from the introduction to the book, where it kind of helps to situate how I, as somebody who didn't live, as Sarah said, through the epicenter through the very beginning, became interested in this topic. And after I finish that, I'll play a passage from the book's audiobook version, which I was really excited to find it exists. And uh, so you'll have the wonderful, wonderfully expressive Paul Woodson reading out uh, the closing words from chapter six. And it'll give you a bit of a taste of what's in the book, and then we look forward to a Q&A section afterwards. Who gets to name? How do they see the world? How do they represent what they see? To whom? A resolute belief in the importance of these questions and the impact they have on the practices of making science and writing history moves me to place myself, as this book's author, more explicitly into the frame. Like all other knowledge creators, I bring to this book my own subjectivity, a particular worldview shaped by my own historically situated experiences, which in turn has influenced, at some levels consciously and at other levels less so, the history I've written. As a white, middle-class teenager coming of age in the 1990s in a suburban city near Vancouver, Canada, my understanding of sexual contact was always informed with an awareness of the risks of HIV and other sexually transmissible diseases. Less clear to me at that time was my own sexuality, which by the time I neared the completion of my undergraduate degree at the University of British Columbia, was urgently pressing me to acknowledge that I was attracted to other men. Though remaining closeted to friends, colleagues, and family members, I began a sexual relationship with a handsome male graduate student I met at one of Vancouver's few gay nightclubs, The Odyssey. It's not in the book. Shortly thereafter, having imbibed the message that responsible sexual health rested upon regular testing for STDs, we went together for what I had assumed to be a regular checkup at the local community-based gay health clinic. My assumption proved to be incorrect when the results returned. The community nurse, after asking me whether I thought that I might, in fact, be HIV positive, informed me that the test indicated that I had contracted HIV. My new partner tested negative. Three very stressful months of further tests and much waiting eventually confirmed that I had been the recipient of a false positive diagnosis. My initial result, an indeterminate combination of a positive screening test and a negative confirmation test, raised the possibility that I had been recently infected and had not created enough antibodies to be read by the confirmation test. As time and further testing proved, a far less likely scenario had occurred. 
I was one of a very small percentage of individuals whose blood cross-reacted with the highly sensitive ELISA screening test. Though I had not been exposed to HIV, my blood yielded a falsely positive test result. This experience at the age of 22 was profoundly transformational on a personal level. At the time of my diagnosis, despite it taking place in the same city where only a few years earlier, the announcement of new therapy regimes had heralded a transformation of the disease, my mind conjured up older and more resilient notions. HIV leading to early death, infection with the virus as a consequence of gay sex. Spending several months thinking of myself as HIV positive sensitized me to fears of dying young and social rejection, to a sense of self-pollution, and to a radically diminished sense of self-worth. Though in retrospect, I can see that I faced these challenges from a position of relative social and economic privilege, the experience often seemed overwhelming at the time. It shattered my previously untroubled confidence in scientific progress and medical authority, and introduced a far more critical engagement with the media's representations of disease. Not long after this experience, I read And the Band Played On for the first time and became transfixed by Schultz's accounts of the 1980s medical and social struggles that forged subsequent understandings of the disease. I was also seduced by his dark depiction of the flight attendant who had spent the last year of his life in my hometown. The 16 years in between this triggering personal incident and my completion of my own book have seen me relocate to the United Kingdom for further study and research, with a significant amount of that time spent grappling with the multifaceted story of patient zero. A commitment to exposing the ways in which knowledge is created, particularly in a work that uses biography as a contextualizing explanatory tool, means that it is important that readers be aware of this background. No scientific or historical account is neutral, nor any author objective. In addition to the meanings suggested in previous chapters, the term patient zero can be read to mean the complete nullification of a patient's perspective. This interpretation seems highly appropriate, given how Dugas' lived experience has been overridden by the fictionalized character popularized in And the Band Played On. Evidence gathered from contemporary sources across North America yields a far more nuanced perspective of the most demonized person with AIDS of all time. Instead of a relentless, immovable killer, an image perpetuated by much of the media coverage that followed the publication of Schiltz's book, we have witnessed the difficult struggles of a young patient during a turbulent time of fear, rumor, and changing information. Early suggestions that AIDS patients should abstain from sex would have jarred with Dugas' pride, not shame, in a gay identity expressed through sexual connection. The evidence suggests that Dugas did continue to have sex through the spring and summer of 1983. Nonetheless, the contemporary medical and scientific uncertainties, the tumultuous rumors, the changing ethical landscape of the North American communities he navigated, and the difficulties he faced in his day-to-day -day life all make it difficult to maintain that to do so was the act of a sociopath. Supporting, as Dugas most likely did, a multifactorial explanation for his illness, he would have believed that it was as much up to others as to himself to reduce numbers of sexual partners and prevent reinfection with other diseases. The fact that he reduced his sexual contacts, became involved in AIDS Vancouver's support efforts, and remained close to friends and family near the end of his life, confirms that there are a multitude of ways to view Gaetan Dugas' experiences of the early North American AIDS epidemic. In the end, it is only by laying the notion of patient zero to rest that we can come close to appreciating what his own views may have been. After we... Okay, so let's, let's talk. So, well, we're, we're going to talk now. Well, I'm going to give away some of the secrets of your book, but not all. So. Um, you know, the, the journalist Linda Villarosa, uh, who recently wrote a cover story in the New York Times showing that 
gay black men in the US South have higher rates of HIV than any country in the world. She recently told me that when the July 4th, 1981 article of seven cases of gay cancer appeared in the United States, there already were 200,000 people who were infected. Now, so one of the, you know, one of the really incredible revelations in your book is that, that this false concept that one man was causing America to get AIDS, when actually now we know that you know, we had, AIDS had been here in different forms for decades, if you can go into a little bit about the mentality that created the theory of cluster and how they came to this preposterous conclusion of trying to identify the, the one person who was the problem, I, I think that would be of great interest to them. So, let's say briefly, um, the understanding of the period during the period from infection to display of sickness was seen to be so much shorter than, and in retrospect, it seems that the cases were being caught so close towards the end of the, uh, the, the natural history of HIV infection that the investigators were looking for a, uh, an infectious agent that resembled most other examples of uh, conditions that might be transmitted sexually. And so unlike, or apart from something like hepatitis, uh, the attack rates, the, the period in between uh, infection and onset of symptoms for anything se uh, transmitted sexually was really short. And I think that framed initial understandings. Um, I think there was also a deep interest in the idea that uh, the earliest cases were identified in the gay community and uh, as other scholars um, have suggested that may indeed have been largely attributable to the fact that the gay men who were seeking treatment had access to healthcare and were more, more visible and more easily counted and recognized. Um, but it was of great interest to early investigators that one of the earliest recognized cases was a flight attendant. He was very sexually active and he traveled around a lot. And so that, it, 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 the evidence was fitting into the hypothesis that was kind of circulating at the time. Right, but as you point out, the, this hypothesis itself was so flawed because it was constructed around this idea of the sexual predator, of the, you know, this nationalist patriotism that Americans are clean and other people give us AIDS. Um, you know, can you, why don't you explain to us a little bit how that stigma was developed? Okay, so in the chapter, one of the things I tried to do in the book, as well as delving into the science the scientific research and the epidemiology that was happening in early the early 1980s uh, was looking at the older tropes that were developed uh, before that. How did the idea of patient zero, when it was coined, largely by accident, um, how did that come to carry a certain communicative force? And I look back to several hundred years of historical examples of disease certainly in, in a Western European context and stories and ideas which were quite easily imported into the United States and uh, histories that were drawn upon uh, when Americans were trying to make sense of the disease, uh, you, you do have examples of uh, diseases being blamed on immigrants diseases being um, never never being attributed to the uh, the, the home nation and uh, and, and so, thus uh, lines of blame being established on uh, on ethnic and uh, racial lines um, you also have uh, long lines of examples of individuals who are sick being uh, ascribed a certain volition to their infectiousness and if somebody was to uh, be sick before somebody else that uh, that somehow they might have uh, intentionally uh, transmitted it. So there's a number of different tropes and, and also um, one of the one of the ideas that actually helped to 
uh, influenced the book's creation initially was when I was trying to trying to absorb a lot of the ideas I was reading in the first few weeks of my master's course on the history of science, medicine, and technology. And we were looking at late 19th century, early 20th century histories of the bacteriological revolution. And um, one book I read was about the so-called typhoid Mary by uh, Judith Levitt. And uh, there's a passage in a couple of pages in that book near the end where she draws an explicit comparison between the experiences of Mary Mallon, uh, an early Irish immigrant working for wealthy families in New York, and who was traced as a source for a number of outbreaks of typhoid. Um, it was fascinating to see how Mary Mallon's experience of not herself ever having known that she was sick uh, the new emerging scientific worldview of people who are not outwardly sick being able to transmit infection, not translating at all into her way of understanding the world and, and almost the, the terrain of knowledge shifting around, physically shifting around her and the drastic consequences that she suffered as a result of long-term confinement um, off, off, right off the city of New York on an island. Um, the author, uh, Judith Levitt, made an explicit comparison between Malin and Dugas, and that really, that really stuck. So that's another thing that is developed, but in some ways this, this book developed uh, out of thinking about how I could expand on and, uh, and draw on my own situation as a, as a gay man with links to Vancouver, um, as I said, the, the city where Gaetan Dugas had spent the last year of his life, and perhaps try and find people who knew him and further contextualize his experience. So it's a long way of answering that the healthy carrier, as it was so called from the early 20th century, is another one of the tropes that informed this notion of uh, a single patient zero. Well, one of your biggest revelations, and this could only be learned by someone who actually goes back and looks at like handwritten notes by CDC people and all of this, is that patient zero, in fact, was actually patient O. Can you tell us about that? How did you realize that? Bill Darrow, the investigator who worked for the CDC, had said in a number of interviews that it was meant to be patient O, but the way by which it became patient zero hadn't fully been explicated. And so to briefly summarize that, in early 1982, at a time when the etiology of AIDS was still unclear, there were some reports that came into the Centers for Disease Control which uh, suggested that some people of AIDS, with AIDS in California had had sex with one another in the years before their diagnosis. And so they sent out Bill Darrow, uh, a sociologist researcher based at the center, and to do some research. And he was joined by, uh, as I understand it, a local uh, epidemiologist who was affiliated with the CDC. And they went out to interview these individuals and get as much information about their sexual histories as they could. And they went around the Los Angeles area and the Orange County area and they found a number of cases and one name of one man stuck out in their minds because a number of the people who were sick mentioned the same name. And because he didn't live in California, they referred as they were writing up this case to him in different ways. They called him the non-Californian case of KS, Kaposi sarcoma, which was one of the, the cancers that was the mo one of the most visible signs of an underlying infection and in one of the ways in which they referred to him they referred to him as the out of california patient and abbreviated that came down as patient o and later when the study was uh further developed and they linked other people with aids through sexual contact to this man the Cases were linked and identified on a, on a diagram, on a, cl on a classic, now it's a classic representation of the study, um, 
but they refer to the cases in shorthand by the city and by the order of diagnosis. And so you would have Los Angeles cases, Los Angeles 1, Los Angeles 2, LA 1, LA 2, LA 3, LA 4. And on the New York side, you'd have New York 1, NY 2, NY 3, and you had patient O in, in the center of this network. And it, it seems very much that either as a, uh, a misreading of the, the, the way that the typewriter rendered O's and zeros, um, by the time it became published, it's very clear in the article that was published in 1984 that a zero is used. And so you can attribute the creation of the term to patient zero, but the author intended it to re read as O. And with zero's long history of multiple, you could say it's a, it's a number that's pregnant with multiple uh, meanings, one of which is the absolute beginning. And it's at that point that you start to see the, the uh, fixing in on an idea that this person may have been the, one, of the, one of the originators. And, and also, you add to that the idea that he was one of the first recognized cases. So it seemed it's always been a term, ever since it was created accidentally, that people can read into what they think it means. And so it, it's ironic that it's been used as a synonym for an index case. Um, an index means to point, but it really is unclear at what it is supposed to be pointing at. Well, in the book, you, you do all this beautiful work on Gaetan Dugas. We find out what he was like, what his life was like, who his friends were, and you really undo the um, you know the demonization that's been done to him historically. And one of the things that was so moving that's revealed in your book is that. One of the reasons that he had more contacts than anybody else was because he actually told the truth about who his contacts were because he was raised by parents who were not homophobic. He was adopted, right? And they, they uh, treated him with decency in the 70s. And so his sense of himself as a gay man was not this one of total shame and closet. And so he cooperated with the authorities and gave his actual contacts, and they used all this against him but because it never occurred to them that other gay people would be afraid to give their contacts. There's like no understanding of how homophobia worked. And I mean, it's so moving and it's just so interesting how they started out so prejudiced from the beginning that all of their decisions just reinforced their prejudices. And it's, it is interesting to, to reflect on the, you know, the, the lack of understanding that existed in mainstream science at the time. I mean, it, it, uh, there's, uh, it really was as if that this was a population that was quite distinct, quite different, and very other. Um, and that's not to say that the researchers conducting this research weren't impressed um, and changed, or even open-minded when they began, some of the investigators working for the CDC had uh, done work engaging with the gay community in the 1970s, and partly in the development of work around hepatitis and the vaccine. And so there, I wouldn't want to characterize it as one of you know, kind of blatant homophobia, um, but also in the absence of uh, representation of uh, Lesbian, out, lesbian and gays in the you know in, in the scientific community, um, some of the prejudices would have been able to go unchecked and uh, yeah, unchecked. Now, one thing that I learned from your book that I've never seen anywhere is that at this one period of time in the early '80s, KS, GRID, and AIDS were three different illnesses. So that when Gaetan Dugas got his diagnosis of KS, he thought he didn't have AIDS. And that's just so important for us to know. Now, how did you figure that out? Because even having looked through it, I didn't know that. So I should say that, that that's my interpretation of some fragmentary sources of uh, uh, something that didn't quite make sense to me as I was reading early interviews with KS pa patients. And it, and it seemed, 
There, I'm thinking of one example in particular, an interview with a uh, KS patient, I believe it was published in Christopher Street in 1982. Um, and and there is this very clear distinction between the, di the different types and it, it, it suggests to me a time before, I mean, it, it, one of the things I bracket that, one of the things that I think historians bring to the, the topics that they study is trying to prevent a um, an importation, uh, avoiding importing our present day understandings of the past and trying to under trying to get at what it might have been like to think to live through that. And it's really difficult to think of it a time when it, it, we don't have our knowledge that we have today that HIV uh, infection is a is a progression um, that. There are certain conditions, opportunistic infections, that come as a result of it being left untreated in most cases. Um, and to have people trying to respond to their sickness in a way that isn't collapsed under that understanding. So to, ha to have this KS patient say, well, you know, there's us people with KS, but there's also the AIDS patients and the or AIDS patients because it didn't have the S at that point, and and then you also have the PCP cases. It seemed initially, um, I, I hypothesized that there was more of a connection around the term gay cancer, even though some people might have disputed that. That was both the condition that would allow people to survive longer, and uh, amongst the cohort of patients that developed here in New York, it seems like a support network developed as well. And but that, there is that interesting point that somebody might have gay cancer, but then read into that further and say, well, it's preposterous the notion that cancer would be transmissible. Who's ever heard of a sexually transmissible cancer? And and use that. Some people might call that denial, but use. I, I tried to pull back against a clear uh, definition of denial and saying it's actually, in order to have denial, you need to actually have something quite strong and clearly laid out in order to turn away from. And it seemed like the information then was anything but. Okay. Thank you. So now I just want to move into the next part of the book. And, and Michael, please, anything you want to say, or I'm definitely going to ask you to, to say your thoughts. So then there's this fascinating turn in the book, which is the popularization of the concept of patient zero. And um, Rich looked at Randy Schultz, who wrote in the band played on, looked at his archives, and uncovered a lot of correspondences with Michael, who was his editor, and in general about this question of how to popularize or whether to popularize patient zero when they had doubts about you know, whether this was an accurate depiction. And it really resonated with me because I remembered at that period when we were so desperate for anyone to care or pay attention to AIDS that there were a lot of strategies that we came up with and participated in that we knew were not completely true. And one of them that I really was, that, that made me think about was there was a time when we were claiming that straight people were in danger too, do you remember that? But actually we knew that wasn't true. But we were just saying that, desperately hoping that they would then care. Of course it didn't work. Um, another time that I know that I participated in, in repressing truth was when we realized that women probably were not um, infecting men. But we repressed that information because we were afraid that if straight men knew that they probably could not be infected by women, they would never use condoms. So that, you know, we just didn't say it. And I remember ha having long discussions with people about distorting that information, but we felt that it saved women's lives if straight men thought that they could get infected by them, even though they probably couldn't. And that also backfired because then women ended up being victimized as vectors of infection when they weren't. You know, so I think that the decision that you document of Michael and Randy struggling over whether or not to include this material that they had some doubts about is very consistent with this whole trend of sort of desperation strategy. I mean, what I think what you're showing is that this um, stigma is, that starts out as homophobia on the part of researchers that makes them come up with these bogus concepts like clusters it becomes exactly the same phenomena in the media. 
but the media also is, is fixated on stigma and homophobia. And the, as the truth tries to battle through, it can't get through because it's always being turned into the predator person with HIV. And to me, that was one of the revelations of your book. Hmm. I'm trying to think where to where to take that. Um, I'm I'm I was struck very much listening, uh, Michael, to your recollections. How m much of that I feel is in chapter four of the book. I feel like I uh, I feel reassured that I managed to get uh, a, a you know the main parts of your argument in into the struggles of getting the book recognized and the way in which the story turned and and also yes the the way in which the mainstream media was hungry for a stereotype of a, a homo an individual to fulfill its homophobic stereotype that it imagined out there and i would also agree um, with the assessment you suggested that there are two parts two really important components I, i'd say the history before that animated the notion of patient zero says that there are more, um, but crucially, the fact that it was the idea of somebody being told to stop having sex and not. So the, the fact that uh, Gaetan Dugas was came into conflict with uh, some public health officials about his continuing to have sex on the basis that he didn't feel he was being presented with adequate evidence to stop. Right, and one thing I want to say is sex was the basis of B Time's whole success as a person, as it was of all of us in the 70s. It was the sexual liberation, you know? That's why it was so incredibly important and so hard to deal with. I mean, the idea of giving up sex seemed insane to I think virtually all of us. And I, and I would I would also say that the the what the term patient zero, which didn't exist before, it seems to have captured or filled a there was a place being held for it in discussions about it, epidemics for the first case. There had never been a a satisfactory uh, term that seemed to summon up the sim simplified version of pointing to one individual, and so patient zero seems to wrap up that up in one term and so that's the other reason i think one of the reasons one of the reasons that captured the media's attention initially was this the salacious elements of him perhaps you know that they were suggesting when he was deliberately trying to infect other people that aspect but it also and in the way that is most often used now is kind of the original <coughs> case in a new outbreak and that seemed to fulfill a need that no other term had managed to do I think, yeah. Okay, yeah. So let's open it up. Okay, well, so we have a few more minutes. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Jack. Yeah, um, I'm interested in two things. Um, one is about this notion of stigma um, in relationship to nuance and detail. And I hear you talking about sex as being this predicator of, 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 of anxiety or causal. In any case, and I'm curious to know what you think about Identifying sex as opposed to particular types of sex of which we're talking about, which is sex that is most likely transmissible, um, particularly penetrative anal sex, is one thing. The other thing I'm interested in hearing is, um, in light of what you're saying about othering um, as being a reason for wanting to have like this kind of origin, like these kinds of origin myths, and such. Um, what your thoughts are about the idea of people that precede Gettian, um, who are people of color, who are black, black men, not, and, and especially in relationship to North, the history of North American racism, like why that, that, that vehicle of othering, why they would not have necessarily been like the, 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 the pointers. Um, you know, for that use for one to other. So to to make sure I've understood. So how how come in a long history of othering and finger pointing at African American men, why did not earlier cases come to the media's attention? 
That's a good question. And then I'll, I'll, the other one is about stigmatizing certain aspects, uh, sex generally, as opposed to specific types well, of- Well, you're saying sex. You're using the word sex. When, and when medically we're talking about HIV transmission, we're talking about particular types of sex. And I bring this up because I know of communities that had determined on their own what types of sex were most likely transmissible and which weren't, and addressed and address it as such. Particularly, like similarly to what you're saying about following houses and who is affected, they were following what people were having what types of sex in order to, to yeah, avoid... Yeah, but as I remember, I mean, for several years there was this big theory that it was the leather boys, it was the s &M, it was that type of sex, which was, like, totally... Well, there are people the who point. said, the people who are you mean specifically dying? fisting? I mean, because this is yeah, one of which the, is this is a theory, fist. this is a theory. Yeah, right? but it was going around The people around that were you yeah. fisting were actually the ones that went the fastest. Yeah. But we're talking about transmission routes, which is blood, blood and semen. Blood and but in 1982, 1983, we didn't know that. Some right. people did, actually. Oh, some yeah. people, some people like in piss communities and in, 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 in um, <coughs> BDSM communities, I'm told. You know, I'm talking about Donald Gallagher's right. narrative, you know, who said, we identified this and we, and we addressed it based on the type of sex that they were having. So they weren't using this overall term of what sex is. And that's what I'm more interested in, is the idea that you can say, oh, it's sex, when we're actually talking about... about before the invention of safe sex, when it's just, quote, sex. Is that... Yeah, they, they, did their own, they did their own research, you know. Let's hear what Rich has to say. Well, I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm enjoying the conversation that's happening here as well, so I... I can say based on my research that I, you do see pockets both of kind of medical, particularly gay medical professionals you have in San Francisco trying to systematize a knowledge about what would constitute riskier versus uh, higher risk versus lower risk. Uh, you have the anecdotal observations of many people in the community that's, that first of all would say, oh, it seems to be the people in the leather communities. Um, but then you also then you, then people would say, well, it seems to be the bottoms. That seems to be a group that is affected as well. So people are coming at it from interpreting a, a variety of different sources of evidence, and uh, and also it really depends on you know, where where you are situated as to which types of evidence you're going to trust, how much faith you're going to put in something put out by the CDC, for example, versus something that might appear in the New York native. And even that would have been, as we were talking over dinner, uh, deemed suspect by many yeah. people. Yeah. Sure. Other questions, Peter? Um, well, I wanted to make a comment first of my interest in coming. is that we did a performance in Montreal that equivocated with Gaetien and Marie Antoinette um, as the very similar trope to, to identify already an existing uh, prejudice you know, against the Austrians in Marie's case and then the pamphleteering that would go on uh, against her uh, as an example of the same kind of demonization. But my question is, um, what do you hope to accomplish in the research that you are uh, interested in doing now about HIV before, or venereal diseases before HIV? Um, thank you. That almost, um, that's almost as if I planted that question. <laughs> uh, um, and, I, and I swear I didn't. Um, so one of the one of the things that really struck me in doing the, uh, trying to do the research as I was writing the PhD version of this um, and chapter two in particularly, which is looking to contextualize the Centers for Disease Control early research, uh, their studies and the cluster study in particular, which was the study in California that that came up was where the term patient O for out of California was initially coined. And I was really struck by the similarities in language that investigators used um, that drew, it seemed to evidently draw upon training from before. And, and, and uh, so clusters, um, particularly the term clusters, and that's not the only use of the term, 
uh, but in the way in which they were investigating sexual contacts and, and establishing histories, to me it seemed to very much be evidence of Bill Darrow's training as a VD investigator in the 1960s. And when I looked at his training manual from 1962, I was very much struck by the fact that it was trying to emphasize that investigators should ask all sorts of questions to establish that the person that they were interviewing as somebody who may have come into contact with syphilis or gonorrhea, the questions they were asking was to, were to try to get this person to admit that they were a homosexual or a, a sexual of deviant sexuality. And I was really I was surprised by this. It seemed I'd absorbed through reading Randy and maybe some other sources too the the notion that it was particularly after Stonewall that the rise of VD rates started going up and kind of led inexorably into the AIDS epidemic. And so I, I found myself wondering, why were investigators so keen to identify homosexuals in 1962? That's much earlier than I would have thought that there would have been any interest. And so part of researching chapter two is thinking, how far back does public health's interest in gay men go as of a group of interest uh, in the transmission of venereal disease, as it was called then. And uh, so the project that I'm working on now is to flesh out what happens essentially between World War II and the rise of the AIDS epidemic, the recognition, and looking at how, how that changed. How did we go from talking mostly about the female prostitute as a vector of transmission, and or the female amateur, in the 1940s to uh, the, the rise by the 1960s of concerns about male same-sex transmission. And looking at not only how did the medical scientific knowledge of, um, emerge and change and how it was spread and communicated and uh, acted out in the examination room, in epidemiology, in the venereal disease investigator's handbook, for example, and teaching like that in the media, but also how did emerging gay rights activists, the homophile organizers, and then the later gay rights activists, how did they respond to the notion that being gay might mean not only that you were being blamed with a psychological sickness, but also that you might be physically sick as well. And so that's what I'm trying to piece together. And, it, and the literature, the, the leaflet that you're referring to is um, invitation for people who lived through the period to share their experiences of what it would be like to have been infected and seek treatment or seek information. Some people might not have sought treatment and hoped to, to be able to, to fix it on their own. And so that's what, that's what the current project is. Okay, so we've got a little final question. I just want to answer Jack's question about why black people were not um, blamed for AIDS initially, although they're being blamed for AIDS now. Hmm. And it was interesting because Linda Villarosa's research shows us that in that famous article, Seven Cases of Gay Cancer um, in San Francisco, actually there were two other cases who were black that were not included in that study. So I think it's because uh, medicine had no interest in black people. And, and you know, they didn't even notice I mean, we know that we now know that AIDS existed, for example, in the homeless communities in New York in the 60s and 70s, where it was called the dropsies and junkie pneumonia. But because of the lack of health care in this country, it never reached medicine in any way that could identify it. So it's the it's a historic erasure of black experience. Yeah. yeah. I'd also add, there were as well some people of color in the cluster study, for example, and I sh I would also say that. Some of the people that were linked or were among the earlier cases, they were, there were reports that reached investigators after they had died. So there may have been chances earlier on had they been interviewed sooner. And it raises different questions about uh, willingness to disclose sexuality in a way that would have allowed them to be linked more clearly to, uh, to investigators earlier on. So I, I, would, I would complicate I would agree and complicate the notion that there was no interest um, in, in, in the, people, the, the, the health of people with color. I'm having kind of second thoughts though, because now, as I, as I recall, there was like the Haitian stigma. So that would actually be a way of blaming black, because I believe um, Gekian is off his, the course of infection is also having contact with Haiti. 
I'm not sure. You can extend. Yeah. Yeah, but that's part of the the strangers that are infecting us, clean Americans. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Rich.